Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zora's Subscription Economy Operating Plan webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that we want to make this event as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions that come to mind, feel free to use the chat function on the right-hand side. So moving right along, today we are joined by Zora's Chief Financial Officer, Tyler Sloat. Welcome, Tyler. Thanks, Dexter. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today, uh, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. I think we actually have a pretty good attendee list. Um, I do want to reiterate what Dexter just said. Please do log questions. I want to make this interactive. Um, the, the whole purpose of this is to, to be educational uh, for you guys, but you know this is an iterative process even for us and for all companies going through this shift from product to subscription. And we want to make sure that we gather as much information and try to respond. And, you know, through that, uh, the, the models will change as well. <clears throat> you know, as a little background, we've been talking a lot about this shift from the product economy to the subscription economy. We, we've, you know, we started talking about a year and a half ago as we started seeing um, a bunch of new customers coming to us with business problems, and those business problems were, uh, evolved around how they were going to be able to have um, a future monetization of their customer base because they saw that a lot of their customers didn't really want to buy products anymore. We started digging into this and you know, we started talking to a lot of those customers and we started talking to a lot of investors. We saw that, that this trend is really not just a trend, it's a monumental shift, but it's happening for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, there's available technology today. Uh, you can go back 15 years when Salesforce just started and you know, there's a lot of questions back then around could you have a true SaaS product? And that was in days of ASP, and now that's not a question anymore. But now what we're seeing is a proliferation of social and mobile that is also playing a role uh, in this shift. Um, there's demand from both consumers and businesses. Um, you know, we, we take it to heart here at Zora. We have no fewer than 25 different uh, SaaS vendors that we use internally, and a pretty empty, um, pretty empty server room in the back of our uh, office. From a business model perspective, it's a no-brainer, and that's what we want to spend most of our time today talking about. Uh, it, it is just well known now, uh, not just you know internal to companies, but external to the investors, that if you get the subscription model uh, correct uh, and you run your business way this way wholeheartedly, uh, it is a much better business model. And because of that, you know Wall Street is rewarding these companies, uh, the ones who do it correctly, the ones who understand their business models, and ones who can prove it out. Uh, are getting valuations that are relatively unprecedented uh, back to the internet bubble. Uh, and that internet bubble was based on business models that really didn't have a business model behind them. Uh, and that's a big difference from today. So what are the proof points here? If you look back at 2011 and 2012, uh, there's 19 software companies or classified software companies that went public. 14 of those were considered SaaS. Uh, and even of the five that weren't considered SaaS, for example, Splunk is in that, in that category where the majority of their business is still uh, on-premise or one-time sell, they're moving to subscription as fast as they can. Um, and they are a customer of ours as well. But it's not just in software, it's not just in SaaS. Uh, we see it happening in, across different verticals and across different industries. Uh, you could look at disruptive technologies and disruptive companies that are making historically uh, entrenched players uh, really worry and start to change their business models. Uh, here's a picture um, across some of these companies. Uh, you know, we have another slide that we didn't put in here that has an example of about 20 different consumer services that the individual can actually uh, subscribe to almost from the moment that they wake up to the moment that they go to sleep you know, wholeheartedly to services without buying a single product. At the core of it all, the shift to what we call the subscription economy is not about, you know, subscriptions. It's actually about the customer. Uh, and it's a shift from a product-focused uh, business model to a relationship-focused business model. Uh, the nuance there is that you know, the subscription obviously is a piece about how you monetize that relationship or how you keep that relationship because there's a lot of subscriptions that might be of, you know, zero monetary value, but you actually have a relationship with a customer that has the goal of increasing the value of that customer to you from a monetary perspective. But there's the shift from the realization that selling something to somebody once and then 
not having any relationship with them is a poor business model. Not just because you, you don't have the propensity to actually increase the value, but because that you won't have the, the capability to utilize that individual as uh, a co-seller for you to acquire your next customer. And that is another thing that, that's happening in this model, is, is businesses realizing that they need to create relationships with their customers, whether consumers or businesses, and through those relationships, not only will they expand the, the footprint of their, of their product and services, thereby increasing the monetary value for that customer, but those customers are going to be references for them. One of the challenges, and one of the biggest challenges that you see is companies are realizing this, and they want to make this shift, and they're looking at the historical product economy businesses, and they say, okay, you know what, we're going to move to more of a services or subscription style business. But then they start to dig underneath and say, what, what, is, what does that mean? What are the actual things that we need to do to be able to make that happen? And they start talking about, well, we sell a widget today. Instead of selling that widget and shipping it, you know, we're still going to provide widgets to customers, but how will we have them subscribe to them? And you know what, maybe we'll keep giving them different widgets every three years or something, but through that we have this perpetual relationship. Or maybe we have different, you know, types of widgets. And over time, we want to actually make them upgrade, uh, and and we want to make, we have the capability to add services to that widget, so that we can actually keep a relationship with them, but maybe we never have to send them something again. Then they realize that this is an entirely different way to think about their business from the transactional perspective, and then think about it from the metrics perspective, and all those metrics change. That's what we uh, try to highlight when we talk about the subscription business model and the nuances of the impact of the subscription economy. When you go down that path, you realize that there are not just one problem, but a couple of problems. The first is that the traditional income statements of today, and these we're referring to gap income statements, are backwards looking. They tell you what you earned last year in revenue. They tell you what you had in terms of costs, and they turn tell you what you spent. Not only are they backwards looking, they're really just one time. You would have to repeat that behavior every single year, and you'd try to increase the behavior on the revenue side, but you would have to do it again and again and again. As opposed to thinking about a concept of time, which exists in the subscription model, whereby you enter the year with something in the bank, and then over time you want to increase your bank balance, and you're going to spend some of it. What the investment community realizes is that, you know what, these businesses are different and we need to think about them differently. However, there's only gap information that's available. And it, there's only gap information that's available for, you know, really two reasons. One, that's what gap is. That's how gap defines uh, the information that investors should need and normalize across all companies to be able to evaluate, uh, you know, efficiently evaluate a, a public company. But two, businesses are not motivated to disclose anything beyond what's required because that puts, you know, uh, kind of, that puts some constraint on how they can run their business because they're going to be held accountable in the street and, you know, for a variety of reasons, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, in terms of the volatility of stock and whatnot, you can really get punished if you have a hiccup. So the more information that's out there, um, there's a realization that the more chance, you know, if you have a misstep as a company or if, if something is not fully understood by the market, you'll be punished for it. So what does the street do? They use revenue, that's available, but they actually aren't really valuing on revenue for these companies. They're trying to value on revenue growth. If you think about revenue growth, that's really a proxy for ARR. They're trying to figure out how, how uh, successful these companies are actually growing their installed ARR base as they grow throughout the year. But the market actually understands that that's not even the only metric that matters. You know, I want to know what ARR is, but I'm also going to try to back into, and by the way, these slides are, you know, from a, a leading bank uh, analyst report that we just got. And, you know, it's a perfect example of how the analyst community and the investment community are all trying to do the same thing now. They're all trying to take what's publicly available and back into what are the metrics that really matter. And in this example, it's retention rates. The problem is that, as you guys know, these, this information is not disclosed. And even when it is disclosed in pieces, it's not consistent across companies. And so when it's not disclosed, you can make estimates about it. 
And then when it's when it is disclosed, you need to make sure that when you're when you're thinking about company A and the way they disclose it versus company B and the way they disclose it, that's actually being consistent. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Then the, the moral of this one is that it's imperfect data, and companies are being valued off of imperfect data today. But as you can see on the right hand side of this, that the valuations actually uh, translate, you know, based on this imperfect data, how they're being traded. What ends up happening is that if there is a misstep again the uh, propensity for a company to actually plummet in the market is, is far greater because the variability of this imperfect data is, it has, a, has a higher um, beta than you know, the actual gap revenue and expense that we're all used to seeing. So let's shift to the subscription business model and the foundation of that business model, which is not currently available in Gap. But you know, as I talk to CFOs who are our customers and other companies who have, have gone public recently, and I ask them, how do you guys actually manage your business internally now that you know, you're public? Nothing's changed. They're all thinking about ARR. Some of them are, think, are putting it into terms of MRR or QRR, but that is the basis of their companies, and that's how they're running those companies internally. You know, everything for us at Zawar result revolves around ARR. We start the period with a certain amount in the bank, and the ARR is annual recurring revenue. During the year, you're going to churn out some of your customers. We reflect that churn in dollars. We also plan to add a lot of new dollars, and that's annual contract value. And at the end of the year, we're going to end with our ARR plus the delta of what we, the net amount of what we added, uh, less churn. When we translate that to a subscription economy income statement, you start your recurring revenue, you have the churn that I just mentioned, and then you have net error. You then have an amount of money that you spend to service your existing install base. We simplify this, and I think simplification will be a theme as we go through this presentation today. At the very beginning, as you start to dig into these models, do not make it too complex, or the education process will be too difficult. Simplify as much as you can, and then you can fine-tune over time. Our simplification is that we have net ARR expected. We spend money on COGS, GNA, and R&D. We think that those are the main elements that actually service your install base, as opposed to providing uh, amounts to acquire new ACV, which is an argument, a debate, but we have, but again, we simplify. And you end up with recurring profit. You'll notice that there is no sales and marketing expense on this sheet. You'll notice that there's no professional services on this sheet. Because though sales and marketing and professional services we view as one-time expenses, sales and marketing is you know, used to grow and acquire new ACV. Professional services is a one-time expense to get a specific customer live. When you think about your business in a subscription mo model, a uh, business model framework, what ends up happening is you end up with a recurring profit, and then you get to decide as a company what you want to do with that profit. You can decide to optimize for margin and really glow, uh, keep your current ARR. So, for example, if you had a growth efficiency of 10, you would spend $10 in sales and marketing, you would acquire $10 in ACV, that get added back to your ARR, and you end up at 100. Or you could say, you know, that's really silly. I have a huge market opportunity in front of me. I want to grow, and I want to grow only to the extent that I actually have money to grow. And so you'd spend all of your recurring profit and growth, and you add that to ARR, and you'd end up growing 30%. You start the year at 100, and you end at 130. You know, most companies in, in the uh, public domain right now, and your know, private companies, are actually going to the one more column to the right saying high growth. And they're spending more than they have. Uh, because that they see the market opportunity that is out there and they know that it's an efficient spend, meaning that they're gonna they're gonna pay it back in spades as long as they can efficiently acquire these new dollars. So then it gets us to the three metrics that matter. Again, ARR is your umbrella over everything. You then have your retention rate, which is the first metric. And that's reflected in churn. Churn is the inverse of retention. You then have your recurring profit margin. This is the same exact example we had on the previous slide, where that recurring profit margin is 40%. You're spending 60, 60 cents, and you're, you're bringing 40% to the bottom line. 
and then you have a growth efficiency index. We're going to go through each one of these concepts. The main purpose of this webinar today is not, this is re a refresher, right, of the three metrics that matter. I think, you know, a lot of people have already seen this. And there's nuances about how you might utilize these internally in your own companies. You know, some people call growth efficiency, they call it CAC, uh, and they have a different way of calculating it. That's not as important as the holistic thought process around what the subscription business model is, and then how you would educate your company on that business model and run your company on that business model. This part is a refresher again, and we're going to quickly get into how you actually turn this into an operating plan. So going from the numerical to the qualitative, uh, the numerical being on the previous slide, the three metrics that matter, they really tell us everything about your business. So your retention rate, it tells you how much ARR are you going to keep every year. Your recurring profit margin is really your entering ARR less your annualized non-growth spend. And again, non-growth you know, excludes sales and marketing. And your growth efficiency is how much does it cost you to acquire a dollar of ACV. And that's a ratio that you can measure and hold your company accountable for. If we expand that, and I'm sure a lot of you are asking, you know, you know, immediately asking the question, say, hey, what about professional services and what about cash? I mean, cash is king, right? Every, every CFO would say that. And those are obviously very, very important elements. We're not going to spend a ton of time today on PS. The commentary I would have right now is that professional services, you know, for a lot of companies is a tax. And the most important thing is you need to understand what that tax is for your business because it's going to have an impact not just on your, you know, your gap margins per se, but it will have an impact on your cash. And if you make a, a realization as a company that you are willing to invest in your customer and thereby losing money on professional services because the benefit of getting that customer live quickly has a much greater payoff in the long run by getting them live and then the ability to upsell and complete, you know, monetize that customer over their lifetime, or even just keep them and not upsell, but they might have a long lifespan for you, that, that tax just should be known and planned for. You know, the ultimate goal is that professional services becomes a contributor to your business. And I think the challenge there is that you need to ask yourselves if on any deal, and you know, consumer deals are different, I think B2C versus B2B is different, but specifically on B2B, if you think there's a finite sum on any deal that you might be closing, you need to challenge yourself on whether you have, uh, whether you choose to have some of that sum in a recurring model versus professional services. I think that's you know kind of a separate topic, but it is an important one to discuss internally. Cash, the subscription business model, you know, it, it really is more about expense uh, at that point in time and recurring expense and recurring revenue. The cash elements, you know, as, as a finance individual, you can manage separately. They are obviously going to be very joined. Uh, but, you know, you're going to spend more on sales and marketing, you know, maybe early on than would be reflected on the, on the income statement. Or you might actually be collecting on your ARR much greater than, you know, you're, you're getting that revenue. And there are things that you can do as a business to optimize for cash. The, the, the trick of this model is that you could have a recurring, uh, you know, a, a, a true operating loss. Most SaaS, successful SaaS businesses do but you could be producing tons of cash. And if you are not doing that, uh, meaning that as you grow, you're actually not producing cash in, a, in, in advance of uh, your recurring profit, if you're there, you need to make sure you dissect your business model and see what's going on. So now let's get into the discussion about the operating plan. Um, you know, we, we've gone through a quick refresher on the basics of the subscription business model, and this is really the meat of what we want to talk about today. It's really, how do you take these concepts, which are truly different than GAAP, and it is a fundamental difference about the way you think about your business, and translate those into actionable things for your e-staff and for your whole company, and then how are you going to keep each other accountable, and then how are you going to run your business going forward? So I thought I'd start with this, and I want to make the contrast. You know, a lot of people think about budgets, and operating plans, and they just have this huge adverse reaction. I mean, I have to admit, I do as well. Um, the, the top quote you know, from Jack Welch essentially just describes that, that, that the budgeting process in most companies is actually detrimental to the growth of the business. 
And, you know, as finance individuals, we feel, you know, like we're the doctor knows of the company and that we are the inhibitors of moving forward. What we are discussing today is something completely different. And I don't want it to be confused with budget. Budget might be uh, something that falls out of your operating plan process, but it's specifically this recurring model, uh, meaning that you get everybody kind of centered around a strategy. But these really aren't, we're not talking about budgets today. What we're talking about is how do you put together a business model that everybody in your company would understand, and everybody in your company would understand that if they execute to it, you could have a great business. So here are the steps that, as I was trying to think about this, that you know, I really think are very, very important uh, in, in, in going through this process, specifically for companies that are making this shift. And then the recurring steps that you should iterate on uh, you know, as often as you see fit in your company. I think quarterly is probably the best time to do it. But it starts with an education process, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. And then there's an alignment and goal setting process. Uh, then you have to make sure that you can you know, continually report and measure on those goals. And then there's an accountability that needs to happen within your company. So if you start with the education, the, the first bit is to really take what people know and translate it for them. People know GAAP income statements. You walk into a board meeting or you walk into an e-staff meeting at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, your first question is, okay, show me your financials and let me know how you did, right? Those financials are gonna be presented like this. But if you go in there and you are a SaaS business that you know, is three years old and you are burning, uh, you're, you're, you're spending like crazy because your, your growth rate's huge, right? But you're on an extreme ramp, your financials are not gonna be reflective of your business. And you, know, you go into a traditional investor and show them that, you're gonna have a lot of explaining to do. So the first thing to do is dissect these financials. These are actually, um, most of the numbers in this deck, by the way, are you know, fictitious. However, I did pick out some real publicly available data. I won't tell you the company, you can go figure it out. Uh, and used it as an example. And for the, this one, this is you know, out of a company's S1. Um, here, you, know, you disclose revenue and you disclose cost of revenue. It's a perfect example of what I was saying is companies would choose not to disclose more than they need to. But the reality of, in that revenue line, you have subscription revenue, usage revenue, and professional services revenue hidden in there. And in that cost of revenue line, you really have cost of subscription, which pretty much includes your cost of usage, as well as cost of professional services. The nuance there is that the PS is one time, and it probably has a horrible margin and is, is making your gap financials look something different than what it should be. So for our translation to the subscription business model, we actually need to be able to pull out the PS and put it in a, down below. And we want to be able to take that revenue and actually reflect it as ARR. So this is an example of a lot of work that we've done here internally at Zura. We've taken about 15 different public companies, you know, Salesforce being probably the oldest, all the way through the companies that are going public now, and dissected their financial, gap financial statements. We know some of these companies really well, so we know that this dissection, you know, it, that were relatively accurate to within 10%. I've talked to a lot of the CFOs to try to get a, you know, kind of try to get a measure on, on how we're doing, you know, and most people will share the information with you if you have a, a good conversation. And then we've shared the same analysis with a lot of analysts out there and some of the big banks, and they've sh shared their data with us. And you know, we're, we're, we're very similar in a lot of different ways in the way we look at it. So what I've done here is taken what, you know, a public company's financials and then dissected it. If you can tell, you know, revenue for their 2011 year was 73 million, but the actual entering ARR was 60 million. But if you look at the ending ARR for that 2011, so they entered 2011 with about 60, and again, there's you know, some estimates there, so it's not perfect. And they ended at about 100. You can see their growth rate is exceptional, right? The estimate that is hardest to get to is churn. Some companies disclose it, some companies do not. And again, when they do disclose it, some disclose it in a much different way. But what, you, what the trick is to, for you as an individual company is to make sure you're just being honest with each other. So you start with ARR, you put forth what your real churn was last year, and come up with your net. You then have your cost of subscription revenue, right? But then you have research and development, general administrative, 
um, expense as well, which all gets to your recurring expense, right? Which talks about your recurring profit margin, which we, are, we already addressed. And then you have what you spent in sales and marketing. And that, you know, produces a growth efficiency index based on what your new ACV is. This translation is very important as you go through this education process to make sure everybody understands how you got from A to B. They understand A and they like to look at A, but you want them to get to know B. You then need to go through the definition of what these terms are. You know, again, we've already talked about ARR, which is you know, enter rate plus new ACV minus churn equals exit. Growth efficiency is a little bit different. And this is one uh, that there will be nuances based on the type of company you are but is one that's very important for you to remain consistent on, but make sure that your company completely understands, specifically your sales and marketing department. We simplify. Again, simplification. At Zuara, it's our sales and marketing expense in any quarter over the ACV acquired in that quarter. We normalize that expense, meaning that we, will, we don't, you know, if we were capitalizing commissions, we would take all of the commission costs for that quarter because we want to know what the true costs are to acquire that ACV. And the third is recurring profit margin, which is, again, all of those cost elements that are uh, spent to service your existing install base. And that's COGS, GNA, and RD. You then need to start talking about the umbrella that sits over everything, which is ARR. And you need to make sure everybody understands why ARR drives everything. On the left-hand side, we created a little, uh, a little visual that just shows a 50% growth business with 10% churn, 30% growth in recurring expense year over year, and a 1.0 growth efficiency, meaning that they're acquiring a dollar of ACV for every dollar of sales and marketing they spend. The green at the top, which is your growth expense, shows you that as the years go by, this company was you know, overspending because they had high growth. And they continued to dramatically spend in growth but they had the right to make the decisions on how much they grow. And at the end of that time frame, they're saying, you know what, we actually want to get to a point where we're not spending any money more than we have. And the sum of our growth expense and our recurring expense is going to equal our ARR. You then need to, as long as people start to understand why ARR drives everything, if you think about the recurring expense here, we're saying, hey, you get to grow every year, meaning you know, R&D, you get to hire every year, but you don't, you, you don't get to hire at the rate our ARR is growing because we want to be able to uh, grow faster. And the faster that we grow, every dollar that we save in R&D, we can put in sales and marketing. And if we put that dollar in sales and marketing, we will grow ARR faster. And a year from now, that'll actually equal, a, you know, a dollar fifty that you get to spend in R&D. And if your leadership group gets their arms around that, they will know that the longer they can hold off and be lean, the more they'll have to spend in the future. You then need to make sure that everybody understands how to grow that ARR. And that ACV is obviously the predominant thing, but churn can be your huge decrement. So let's talk about each one of these metrics, and then we can uh, get into a few things about how you operationalize this. Churn. The first thing here is that you know, my opinion, uh, be conservative and be honest with yourselves. I put up here two examples from S1s that show how different companies think about it completely differently. Success Factors was, you know, very open, but, you know, I would consider notorious about saying they had negative churn because they would consider churn to be uh, a calculation based on how, many, how, uh, how much new and upsell they had as well. Whereas Cornerstone is more in line with how we look at it, where we say, hey, there's an entering dollar amount based on customers. And throughout that year, that entering dollar amount with those same exact customers, some of those customers are going to leave. And I want to know how much uh, of those customers leave. And based on that, against what the entering amount is, I'm going to calculate my churn. Internally, uh, again, you know, today you don't have to disclose it externally, but if you really want to run your business and be able to improve it, you should be honest with yourselves internally. Your growth efficiency index is the next thing. So we just talked about ARR, and then we talked about churn, which is also you know, the inverse of retention rate. And now we're growth, on growth efficiency index. Growth efficiency, I think, is one of the most important things. On, on, uh, you know, churn, if that's your decrement, obviously growth efficiency, how you're going to grow. And if you're in a high-growth company, 
this should be, you, you should optimize this and expect it to get better and better over time. You should get more efficient in the way you acquire. We simplify and we say, you know, all marketing spend and all sales spend over ACV. Depending on your sales cycle, you might choose as a company to say, hey, but I spend marketing in Q3 for deals that close in Q1. If you are consistent in that application, you could justify saying that's how we're going to measure our growth efficiency index. The dollars that we spend in marketing that truly go towards acquiring the ACV at a certain period of time. And that's fine, but you just need to be consistent about it. I recommend simplifying. Because if you simplify, it'll normalize over time. Once you know the calculation, and you make sure that your sales leadership and your marketing leadership, and if you have multiple owners, by the way, you need to make sure they are all aligned. But once you have the calculation, you then need to understand what the right goal is. That growth efficiency goal, you know, we're, we're the first ones to say that, you know, we have a goal internally as we were of 1.0. 1, 1 we want to spend a dollar of ACV to acquire a dollar, uh, uh, spend a dollar sales marketing to acquire a dollar of ACV. And we hope to improve that over time. And we are, we are there. We want to be able to improve that because if we can improve that, that means we will be able to scale faster. If we see our growth efficiency actually decline in a quarter, we have to first say, hey, is there a market condition that's happening? Um, or two, did we just scale a little bit too fast and we got a little bit in front of our, in front of our skis? The growth efficiency and the churn play hand in hand, right? If you have a very high retention rate or low churn, you could probably afford a higher growth efficiency, meaning that you could spend more to acquire a dollar because they're going to stay with you for longer. If you have a, you know, not so high a, a retention rate, you probably need us to accompany to really make sure that your acquisition costs um, are lower. The best examples of this are Salesforce and Success Factors. If you look at their numbers, Success Factors at one point had a growth efficiency index of 1.5 to 2, meaning they're acquiring, they're spending two dollars to acquire a dollar. They could do this, you know, although their churn was, you know, you know, self-described as negative. But if you kind of normalize their churn, it looks like it really was around eight percent. So in the low 90s in retention. They were servicing a lot of enterprise com companies, and it made a lot of sense. Once they got in there, it was very sticky. Salesforce, on the other hand, was servicing a lot of SMBs. And their retention rate was really in the mid-80s, so their churn was around 15%. Because of that, they couldn't afford to spend $1.50 or $2 to acquire ACV. If you look at the numbers, their uh, growth efficiency index was more around 75 to $0.85 cents to acquire each dollar. Those two things play hand in hand. You need to make sure for your business model that you understand that. Churn and retention is not just enough to be able to say, hey, our churn rate goal is this. But the whole purpose of this business model, right? Again, this is not a budget. This business model is to make sure that the people who you're educating can then walk away from that education with a way to maximize the results. So you think about churn. You think about, okay, well, churn is an after-the-fact number, right? So many company leaves, they earn the churn number. So how do you actually impact churn? And what this business model should really do is force that kind of thought process. That thought process for, you know, a standard company with an implementation would look very much like this. Hey, we close a deal. If we don't get them live, they're going to churn. All right, so let's focus on getting them live. Once we get them live, hey, if they're not using the product and adopting, they're going to churn. Right? So let's make sure that we focus for our live customers on usage and adoption and getting our new products out there. And it goes on and on and on. And this should be an iterative process owned by probably an account managed group, group in your company. Recurring profit margin. You know, so we've gone through churn, we've gone through our growth efficiency index, and now we're at a recurring profit margin. This one is um, one that the, the numbers really, really play a hard role, and it's all based off of ARR. Uh, is, and this is probably the closest to a normalized budgeting process. So if you're in a budgeting process and you are a, product, a historical product economy business, you're like, hey, we have a 60% gross margin because we have some costs and we have a goal of 15% operating margin, we're going to drive certain segments of our business to a percentage of revenue. That process is not that dissimilar. The nuance is that if you look at how ARR grows, 
you want to be able to drive your recurring expense down and your current profit margin up. But what you need to be able to demonstrate to the stakeholders in those businesses is that even though as a percentage we're going down, let me show you how if we get ARR higher, you will be able to spend more. And this little picture is like, hey, last year it was 90K or 90 in ARR. You know, next year it's 135. Your percentages are going down. I'm getting from a recurring profit margin of 30% all the way up to 40%. That's a really healthy business. Your R&D guy might come back and say, God, but I'm not building new products and I won't be able to support that kind of growth. You say, well, well wait a minute. Last year you spent 27, right? I'm saying you can spend 34 this year. You know, you get to grow 30%. Is that not enough? Um, and then you can have the discussions around it. You also need to be able to break out, you know, each one of these elements. I broke it out in the way we think about it. Uh, and then be able to give those out to the stakeholders. This is probably the closest thing that would then get to a budget and that you would be able to demonstrate to a customer. Now let's figure out how to operationalize this. We've gone through all that. You've gone through an education process with your company and you've educated them on all the metrics. By the way, we're going through this pretty fast. We are going to post this presentation later. Uh, and, you know, we'd be happy to have follow-ups. Um, and if we get enough commentary on stuff that we want to do deep dives in, that'd be a great way to have a secondary webinar. But as we, as we go, once you go through your education process, you obviously have to put it into play and operationalize it. Here is an example of how you would operationalize and do at the very high level modeling. So you still are doing the education, but you're actually going through the initial process by saying, this is what it would look like if we start running our business this way. This is what our ARR would be, you know, entering and going through every quarter. This is what the growth would look like if we have new bookings and we have different types of churn. If we spend this much in sales and marketing and we hold ourselves accountable to a growth efficiency index, this is what's going to drive the bookings above. So the color highlights on this, on this page actually correlate with each other. This, if we spend this much in non-sales and marketing, this is what our margin is going to be. And this is how it'll grow over time if we hold ourselves accountable to a, um, a recurring profit margin. This is how we'll be able to grow over time. This is the highest level modeling that you should keep. And by the way, this is the exactly, not the numbers, but exactly the way we would go into a board meeting and present in our operational plan for the upcoming year. Not a traditional income statement, but in this kind of framework. Hey, we are expecting to grow ARR by this. We are doing it by holding ourselves accountable to a growth efficiency index, which means that we want to spend this much in sales and marketing. We are expecting churn of this percentage based on our enter and install base. Based on those two things, we expect ending ARR to be X, which means an overall growth rate for the company. We have recurring expense today of this. We are going to drive that recurring expense per, uh, and our profit margin, recurring profit margin up by doing this, but we still want to invest in technology and it's really important for us. So this is what we're going to spend. This is really important to get all the, the different elements educated first, but then you can actually have iterations of this high level model. On your detailed modeling, you then need to go a level, level detail, uh, deeper. We call this our L2 model. Um, and L2 is level two, right? So if you start at the high level modeling, which is the previous slide, you then need to go through an iteration almost with every kind of group on what their L2 model would be. This is an example of our L2 growth model, right? Again, all the numbers are different here, but this is the way you should think about it. It is not that much, that, not that dissimilar to any other sales model, but at the bottom, you have a growth efficiency index, and that's what you're holding yourselves accountable to. So as you ramp up sales reps, you have your standard ramps and your standard quotas, right? But you then expect to uh, produce uh, an amount based off of that quota. You know, you have your over signs out in the market. Uh, what we've seen typically in companies, those usually get to about 70% of what's at the street. You have your ratios of your reps to your SEs and your reps to your, your lead gen folks and your reps to your managers. You need to make sure that you capture all the costs of your sales. And then you have a percentage of marketing that you want to spend in different areas. Now, different companies can do this differently. They could say, well, no, marketing actually drives most of our sales, and we have an inside sales group. So they might 
put an emphasis on the marketing spend as opposed to the sales spend, which is totally fine. It's just really what, what are the nuances of your business. But at the end of the day, you need to have a growth efficiency. You got to hold yourselves accountable to it. The importance here is that you will continue to grow over time. You probably don't want to model if you're a B2B business what's in, uh, above your quota capacity, but that quota capacity will build, will build over time. And as you build, as you have salespeople who are ramping, they're contributing costs without contributing ACV, right? Their quotas are ACV, annual contract value. That annual contract value gets added to ARR. So when you're giving out those quotas, but you don't expect them to close anything, they're actually a drain on your growth efficiency index. That means someplace else you need to be saving money to get back to, say, your 1.0 growth efficiency, or you should expect to have a higher growth efficiency index that quarter. So if you enter a year, and a lot of companies do this, you ramp up your field and you hire 15, 20, 30 reps all at once, you're going to expect for a quarter of those reps are not going to be productive, but they're going to cost you money. And so you need to make sure that you account for that. Once you go through your detailed modeling, you then need to start reporting this on a consistent basis and holding uh, your e-staff as well as your whole company accountable. We use a Padre framework internally here. We've seen it used that. I've seen it used at other companies, and it, it really works if you are consistent in your application. Padre is position, acquire, deploy, run, expand. We add a PPM to the bottom, which is product, people, and money, which has you know has a role in the subscription business model but the elements at the top are really driving most of your metrics. If you put that Padre framework into action, you should be able to produce dashboards each week that everybody, uh, say at eStaff, would be able to look at. And at the top of that dashboard, you start with pipeline, right? Which is your P. Then you talk about acquire. Then you talk about deploy. You talk about run. You know, you talk about expand at the bottom there. And then it's really about accountability. Who would you look to each week, each month, each quarter to make sure that as you think about this waterfall of activity that happens, that drives eventually an increase to ARR for your company? Who are you going to look to and hold accountable for those metrics? And how do those different things play against each other? If you have pipeline and you're, 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 you're doing a great job of driving pipeline, but you're still not acquiring, your conversion rates are going down, how do you have a conversation around? And if you are then acquiring tons of companies, but your professional services organization is not successful in getting them live, what does that mean for churn downstream? But what does that mean in terms of the way you should be engaging on the sales side upstream to make sure that you mitigate these types of risks? This is the type of behavior that you want to drive in your e-staff, which will then be reflected in your business model over time. The R&D and G&A obviously play a role in all of it. And quite frankly, I could have put about 20 different uh, arrows on this chart so that all of these different groups are accountable across the entire segment. Because the answer is that the whole company is accountable. We have kept this pretty high level today because it really is an introduction about how you would take the subscription business model and transfer that into an operational uh, business model that you can then get your company around the mindset around, but then your e-staff around and your board around and your investors around. And if you do this um, consistently uh, and you hold yourselves accountable to it, at the end of the day, it will truly be reflected in gap financials that you know look great over time. But it really will help you run a business that is very successful. So now we're going to move to the Q&A portion of the bit of the uh, of the presentation. Thank you for uh, staying with us uh, for this time frame. I know that. That was a pretty long deck. There's a lot to cover there, um, and there's a lot of different sections we could have done deep dives into uh, and spent an entire hour on. So uh, one of the first questions we had was, what is the difference between ARR and ACV? Um, you know, ARR is annual recurring revenue, and ACV is annual contract value. I, I spent a little bit of time just talking about you know, ARR plus new ACV minus churn equals X in ARR. The, the, the nuance of really what ACV is, in our minds, is um, you know, how you add to ARR. But when you really think about it, where does ACV come into play? Um, each customer should have uh, an ARR number tagged to them. So whether you're using Salesforce, whether you're using you know, Zora, whether you're using some other system, you should understand for your customer base what the ARR is associated with every customer. 
as they add on to their subscriptions and they do amendments, right, and, they, and you upsell them, that would be an, an increase of ACV, which adds on to that ARR. We, and I think you know, most businesses who are, who are operating under this business model, quota our reps on ACV. So our sales guys have an ACV quota. There's concepts of TCV, which is total contract value, which would be the sum of the years of ACV. But uh, we are very focused on ACV because we view that as the driver to ARR. The difference, uh, there's another question, what is the difference between live churn and PS churn? So if you go think back to the churn slide that I have, and uh, you think back to say, okay, what were the, the whole purpose of this subscription business model is not to come up with a budget necessarily, but to come up with a set of metrics by which can drive behavior in your company. One of those behaviors was around churn. And churn being a number that happened is reflective of actions that have already happened. You really want to be able to push upstream and be able to think about how do I influence churn? And you know, for a lot of businesses that have a professional services element, that influence comes on, you know, you close your customer, but if you cannot get that customer live, there would be PS churn. And that can happen for a whole lot of reasons, right? A customer might change their business model right after they buy. They still might be paying you, and they still might, you might still collect all the cash, but they're not going to implement you. Um, that would be called PS churn, professional services churn. So a customer that you won't get live, almost guaranteed, they will, they will churn out as soon as possible. Then there's live churn, which is okay. You know, if you think back to that slide, we got them live, but maybe they're not using the system. And maybe they're not adopting our new features and functionality. That customer is, you know, at risk of churning as well. And you need to be able to create metrics in your company that you can look at your customer base and, uh, based on how you're looking at that base, uh, that customer base, have predictors of churn. Yeah, I, there's there's a question I think that is really good. It said, "This is a lot. It seems overwhelming. What's the best place to start?" I think the best place to start, um, and I agree, it, it really is a lot. And that's why in the operating plan section, I had most of the sl slides around education. The best place to start, I think, is the high-level modeling on just what would a subscription business model look like. And you start with your entering ARR. You think about churn that's happened in the past, and you think about how, you know, are we getting better, are we getting worse, is it going to be the same, modeling that in thinking about how your field is doing and what you expect them to close based on quota capacity, and that's your new ACV for the year, and then you have your exiting churn. And then you should know kind of what your run rates are, right? Not what your, your prior expense was, say, for R&D, because that prior, you might be hiring people. You really need to understand what the run rate of your R&D expense is and start putting that in, and that's your recurring expense. Once you start filling in these blanks, you have a model by which is going to give you a picture for what's really going to happen during the year. And then you can start breaking that into months or quarters and just start playing with that. And once it starts to, to click in terms of it is reflective of your business as you understand it today, then you can start doing a little bit deeper modeling. But I would, I would start very high level. Um, there's, a, there's a good question here is how do we or should we factor in delayed payments into churn you know, for example, a renewal schedule for January, but a customer pays in March, okay? Um, there is a gap answer to this, and then there is the business model answer to this. I, I started at the beginning saying, you know, cash is different from this model. Um, and really, there is a whole other presentation we could do on how you model cash out in the subscription economy, and what can you do to optimize cash from your customer base. The gap answer is, if it's standard practice that you have 90-day payment terms, then, you know, that's fine. Start considering that ARR, and if you have a history of collection from that customer, that's great. But if you don't have standard practice and there's any risk of that customer not paying, then you, you know, you should really should consider not consider uh, putting an ARR. Internally, what I've done in here, what we've done at different uh, prior companies that I've been at, is first, you want to be able to motivate behavior. Right? You want to be able to motivate behavior in your sales force to sign clean deals. Uh, as you know, that motivation typically comes from uh, cash. And you, know, you can use a carrot or a stick. I think for this one, I personally believe a stick is more appropriate because you want to get to a benchmark, which is what is 
the standard, and then anything outstanding outside of standard, you know, essentially will be punished. If you do the opposite, you create the standard as having delayed payment terms, then you have to motivate, you know, you have to put in a carrot to get to what I would argue should be standard. Standard, net 30 payment terms, right, on an enterprise business, or credit card for a BDC business, which are hitting your account immediately. Or uh, if you're going to give up quarterly payment terms for, you know, an SMB business, it has to be by ACH, so there's actually no collections process, and you get that customer to sign an ACH waiver when you sign the deal. The stick in this, in this case was if by chance we allow you to close a deal that doesn't have those, uh, those elements to it, we will not pay you until we get paid by that customer. You would be shocked how this drives behavior within an organization once you start putting these rules in play. You'll also be shocked on what influence uh, a company who uh, is historically been billing their, com their customers quarterly or semi-annually, once they move to an annual net 30 in advance model, how, uh, what a dramatic influence this has on the cash picture of that business. And when you change the cash picture of your business, ultimately that plays right back into the entire model that we talked about because you can then fund growth at a higher level. Your inhibitor to growth is not just your growth efficiency index, but it's also how much cash you have in the bank. Right? You might have the best market opportunity in front of you, and you might be acquiring new ACV at $0.10 cents on the dollar. But if you don't have enough cash to be able to take that model through fruition, you're going to be stuck. So we'll have one more question. That question here is, where do refunds and SLA or service credits get fit into the model? Fundamentally, those refunds and, and service credits, they're one-time events, right? And they shouldn't influence your ARR, if you really think about it. But they do influence your cash. They would influence your gap revenue. If you believe, if you close a customer that you, you expect that you're not going to be able to hit it, and you are going to have credits, you know, over time, you should estimate that and actually create uh, almost like a downsell number into your churn number, which would then be reflected in your ARR. So churn for us, you know, you could include downsell in that number, and we do. Uh, meaning that if you have, uh, if new ACV is motivated by reps, your account management group is motivated to make sure that the customers stay at their same value. If you do have downsell, that has to be reflected in your ARR somewhere. You can either call it out as a, a whole different uh, number, or you could just bundle into the churn number. Thank you very much for joining us today. I know it was a lot of content, but we think it's really important. Uh, we went through this shift ourselves uh, in terms of operating plan and business model about two years ago. And this truly is the way we run our company today. Uh, every day, we, uh, every East F meeting, we start with an ARR number. We talk about our progress against our goal. and. Uh, individually for the recurring expense owners, they know what ARR number we need to get to that allows them to hire a new headcount or allows them to spend more. And it's a recurring profit number that we have as a goal as a company. Um, our ACV, our, we hold our sales guys accountable and we hold ourselves in marketing accountable to a growth efficiency index. That is our goal. Our board is acutely aware of it and we actually have motivated uh, ourselves from a bonus perspective and everything else to hit these metrics. Once we did that shift, the entire mindset of the company changed, and everybody started rallying around certain objectives. Once we know we hit those objectives, you know, one, we'll be able to grow a lot faster, but two, everything just gets easier as you go through this process, meaning that you start hitting the objectives, then growth starts to feel easier because you know what you're doing, or churn starts to feel better because it's going down and you understand why it's going down. Because you've dissected your business model and it motivates behavior as opposed to being thought of as a budget. So thank you everyone for, uh, for attending today. We will uh, post this deck, uh, and we'd love follow-up questions. We'll try to figure out a medium by which we can take those. Thank you.